Good afternoon. My name is Dwayne Porter. I'm a faculty member in the Arnold School of Public Health. And I'm actually on a joint appointment between the Department of Environmental Health Sciences in the Arnold School of Public Health and the Bell W. Baruch Institute for Marine and Coastal Research. I was asked to provide a little background as to myself and then begin to talk about environmental health sciences in the context of public health. As a way of introduction, I grew up in the hills of West Virginia, a very rural state where we had the opportunity to both enjoy as well as gain a living from the environment. And I came to the state of South Carolina on August 1st, 1985 with a three-year plan. I was going to come into South Carolina, learn what I needed to do, and get the heck out of Dodge. I'm now on my 11th three-year plan, and in a large measure due to my association and gained appreciation for public health. And I sit in a Department of Environmental Health Sciences, and often people wonder, why do we have environmental sciences in a school of public health? And I have to first off correct people and say it's not a Department of Environmental Sciences, but it's a Department of Environmental Health Sciences. And I hope in the, the few minutes I have afforded to me that I can pass along that appreciation for environmental science versus environmental health sciences. And I, I should preface this by forewarning you that I tend to lecture in three hour blocks and meander all over the, the classroom. So to constrain myself to a four legged bar stool and five or six minutes is a bit of a challenge in itself, but hang with me here. A number of years ago, now going on approximately 20 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, the then dean of the Arnold School of Public Health was Dr. Winona Vernberg. And Dr. Vernberg was married to Dr. John Vernberg, who was at the time the director of the Baruch Institute. So I was brought in initially with the Baruch Institute, a coastal research entity and quickly associated with a school of public health. Dr. Winona Vernberg, our dean, took me to a conference in San Diego in 1993-ish. At this conference, the then Assistant Surgeon General of the United States challenged the public health community to bring the environment back into public health. The Assistant Surgeon General had a number of observations as to what was going on in the human health and the public health community. And he spouted out a number of stats about what was happening with our youth, and in particular, newborns. And a statistic that he used at the time was that 2% of all newborns were being diagnosed with some level of developmental delays by the age of two years old. And in 50% of those cases, the, the medical community could not determine the cause or even come up with a strong correlation as to what was contributing to the, the health concerns. And he challenged the public health community to reach down again to your roots and bring the environment into it. Dr. Vernberg came back to South Carolina and she began to assess the characteristics, the public health characteristics of our population. And what she came away with is for better or for worse, we're a living laboratory. We had all of the health concerns that the Assistant Surgeon General was discussing. And she took that as a challenge to work with her husband, Dr. Vernberg, to begin to advance our department to be a true department of environmental health sciences, to not just focus on the environmental aspect of it. This created a challenge for us because we sat in a school of public health, but we were a very, we could have been a marine science program, to be honest with you, because we looked at grass shrimp and shellfish and sand movement and things that we didn't see the initial link to public health. 
So we had to, to restructure ourselves, and it was a learning experience. Sitting in academia in a school of public health was fantastic. We were forced out of our cubicles and out of our labs to start to talk to our colleagues in a variety of other departments, whether it's biostatistics or epidemiology or uh, health education and uh, promotion. It was a great experience, and we began to realize that the environment is much more than land, sea, and air. And these days, I like to refer my students and the folks we work with in the communities to the National Environmental Policy Act. So NEPA, for short, is the seminal piece of environmental legislation. It was passed into law by then-President Richard M. Nixon on January 1st, 1970. And NEPA was intended to require the federal government to begin to assess the impacts of their activities on the environment. Where our School of Public Health was really able to grab onto this is that under NEPA, the environment is defined as more than just the land, sea, and air that I recently referred to, but to also include society, culture, the economy, and public health. So under NEPA, we define the environment as much more broad than what an environmental science program may do. And so we look at the environment in a, in a very different way. We look at how our activities may affect the environment, and oftentimes we refer to anthropogenic activities. And those are man's activities and the impact that we can have on the environment, either individually or collectively. And we also talk about physiographic influences, and that's where Mother Nature comes into play, whether we're talking about storm events or flooding, or nowadays we spend a lot of time talking about climate variability and changing temperatures. And these are all tied to physiographic influences that may or may not be impacted by our anthropogenic activities. So everything is connected within public health. I also think it's very important to point out, as I move into some examples that try to tie together how we look at the environment and we study the environment and we try to predict what is going to take place in the environment is the role of students. And I am a big believer because I sit in a school of public health of two mantras, one of which is community-based research and the second is research-based learning. And community-based research means that we're not sitting here doing research just for the purpose of getting another publication. Publications are incredibly important in the academic and the research world. But more importantly is ensuring that we're doing research that is addressing the needs of our constituents. Whether we define our constituents as the residents of South Carolina, the, the people in the environment of the Southeast, of the United States, of North America, or our ever-shrinking globe, we have to ensure that we're doing our best to identify the needs that are out there and identify ways in which we can begin to address those needs to overall improve the quality of life. And our students are major contributors to the adva advancement of our research and improving quality of life. So one example I'd like to walk through that in my mind ties together this broad definition of the environment, the importance of community engagement, and using research to stimulate learning evolved out of a former graduate student in our Department of Environmental Health Sciences. A number of years ago, we had a student who, a very ambitious young lady, who not only was a graduate student, but she was also a full-time employee of a state agency in South Carolina. And her responsibilities were tied to determining whether or not it was safe to swim in our beaches and to notify the public as to whether it was safe or not, recognizing that tourism is a multi-billion dollar a year industry 
in South Carolina, and we have folks from all over the country and all over the world these days who make annual treks to the Grand Strand area, which also is referred to Myrtle Beach in South Carolina. And our state health agency has had a long-term monitoring program where they are monitoring the conditions of our beach swimming waters. And if they identify that there is an elevated bacterial level, they will issue a notification to discourage people from swimming in the beaches. The way that the process entailed is that a beach manager would go out to a beach on a given morning and take a water quality sample. The, the water quality sample would be sent off to a laboratory for analysis that would take up to 24 hours to complete. The lab would then return the results to the uh, public health officials. And if there was an elevated bacteria level, in the analysis, they would then issue a beach swimming advisory. The process sounds good on paper, and it is certainly compliant with the expectations and requirements of our federal agencies that provide guidance as to what is and is not safe levels of whether we're talking about bacteria or other contaminants in our swimming waters, but the process took 24 hours. And in doing so, we were potentially exposing populations, in particular vulnerable populations, our very young and our very old, to bacterial laden waters for the course of a day at the beach. And if you have exposure to bacterial laden waters, you can find yourself dealing with gastrointestinal disorders and other things that can be very disruptive to your week at the beach. And we try to not have that happen because it's not only a public health concern, but it's also a concern for economic vitality. If we have too many cases of our residents from Ohio coming to the beach and spending half their time at the dock in the box because their three-year-old has ingested a lot of water and has a, a very upset stomach, then, you know, they're not gonna be coming back that often. So we had a public health concern and a concern for economic vitality. This student who had a responsibility for issuing the beach swimming advisories will admit that she was fine with the process up until such time that she had her first child. And the realization set in that she did not want her daughter or anyone to be exposed to conditions that could lead to a, an illness. And she took it upon herself working within our department to develop a graduate thesis that began to address the issue. And she identified ways in which we could come up with preemptive predictive models for assessing when the conditions were such that there may be a water quality concerns, a need to issue a beach swimming advisory. I can tell you that her initial efforts were not well received by everyone. In particular, the Chambers of Commerce were concerned that there would be this opportunity to provide a black eye to the tourism because more often than not we would be predicting that there was bad water quality when in fact that wasn't the case. So we realized we had a responsibility as public health practitioners to ensure to the greatest extent possible the health of the vacationers and those at the beach, but we also have a responsibility not to oversell the science or to create a, a panic when there is not one. So we worked very closely over the years with our public health officials from the local level to the state level to the federal level and with the chambers of commerce to improve our modeling efforts. And think about it this way now, if we have the ability because of a concern a student brought to our attention, brought to the attention of the state of South Carolina a number of years ago that will allow us to better protect public health by issuing beach swimming advisors, beach swimming advisories when they are warranted and providing our tourism boards and our chambers of commerce a heads up of say 24 to 48 hours as to when conditions may warrant the issuance of, of a beach swimming advisory. We can educate the public 
as to what's going on and the chambers and the tourism boards can kick in with their own advertising to draw people away from the beach. So the reality is when we start to work beyond the bounds of our individual disciplines to focus on quality of life, and quality of life is tied to how well the economy is doing, how well the environment is faring, how well people feel about where they are, what they're doing, and their condition. It's a win-win situation. So uh, a very simple but powerful example of how a student, how you all in the classroom can make a difference starting today and moving through your career. So in closing, I would like to leave you with my charge to you as the next generation of resource managers, public health practitioners, wherever your career interests and your passion takes you is to take advantage of these opportunities that you have now as a student and get beyond the classroom. Begin to interact with your faculty and organizations within your community to start to fuel your passion now. Classroom learning is absolutely fabulous and is critical to the, the education process, but the learning process itself has to go beyond. Look for and take advantage of opportunities where you can take what you've learned from your textbooks and begin to see how it does apply and in some cases does not apply to the real world and get engaged. There are research opportunities that can be developed with faculty. Look within your communities and see where you have the opportunity to take your blossoming passion for whatever it is and go out and begin to make a difference in the community. I will offer this up as my closing comment. A number of years ago, when I began to do some administrative work for our department, we did an initial survey of the agencies and organizations that either was hiring our students or should be hiring our students. Almost every single agency said to us, you all are doing a fantastic job of educating your students in the classroom. They come to us with a wealth of laboratory and book knowledge. Then we have to spend the next 12 months deprogramming them as to how the real world works. Can you all please develop real world opportunities for your students so that they can merge the classroom learning with the real world? And our School of Public Health took that to heart. And we work very hard to identify and create opportunities for our students to take what they're learning in the classroom, such as an important course like this, and begin to apply it in the real world. It's never too early to begin that process. And what we find today is that those students that take that extra effort, go that extra yard, that extra mile, to develop skills that are relevant to the real world, that build upon their classical education training, then those are the ones that are head and shoulders above when it comes time to that next step in your career. So keep that in mind. Good luck and enjoy the course. <laughs>